Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to worship in your house today, Lord. Lord, we pray for Pastor Bill that he would deliver your message today as you would have him, Lord. Lord, we continue to pray for our nation as we know we're far from healed. We pray that you would bless this offering, Lord, and that the church would use it well and according to your, your will, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Oh, precious sight, my Savior stands Dying for me with outstretched hands Oh, precious sight, I love to gaze Remembering Salvation's day Remembering Salvation's day Though my eyes linger on this scene May passing time and years not steal The power with which it impacts me The freshness of its mystery The freshness of its mystery
how often do we lose the wonder of the cross? I, I sat there and repented of that this morning. I repented, Lord, as they were singing that, it just struck me. Lord God, don't let me lose the wonder of your cross. You sang that where your love friend read. We may have to go home. <laughs> where your love, red ran, love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. Wow. We didn't plan this with the worship team, but they could not have chosen any better songs to sing with us today to look at this fourth chapter of Daniel than those songs. And I hope in a few minutes when we're done, that you will see that. And I hope that you'll leave here with a refreshed and renewed wonder, wonder of the cross of Jesus Christ. Nebuchadnezzar is an interesting bird, if you haven't noticed that already. I mean, how many chances does one guy get to get it right? And he seems to almost get there. I'm going to have to move this or I'll pick it up and start blowing it. Um, he almost gets there. Almost gets there, and then he somehow loses it again. Hmm. I don't know about in your life, but that sounds awfully, awfully familiar. It really does. I hadn't planned for this sermon to be a confession sermon, but it may turn into confession. I don't know. An acknowledgement. But I want you to hear what Nebuchadnezzar says, starting in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 1. And i got to clear my eyes up or I won't be able to read it. It's a long passage. But hear the word of the Lord. Hear it carefully. He starts by issuing a decree. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell on the earth. Now, that's pretty arrogant to begin with, don't you think? I'm the one speaking to everybody. So everybody listen. Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. Wow. Maybe there's a little bit of humility slipping in here in old arrogant King Nebuchadnezzar. And then he issues this praise statement, if you will. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. A lot of people looking at this say that it sounds like those first three verses really should have been included back at the end of chapter 3 where Nebuchadnezzar, you know, determines that the people are going to have to serve the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or be torn limb to limb and their houses laid in ruins and, uh, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And, and so a, a lot of commentators think, well, maybe those verses should have been back in chapter 3. I don't know. But, but I know this. Nebuchadnezzar came to a point after seeing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saved out of that fiery furnace where he said, the Lord God is God above all other gods in my country. Now, he didn't say, let's destroy all the gods in my country. He didn't say, let's do away with polytheism. He didn't say, let's put all the idols to, to, to ruin. But he said, this God is greater than all my gods. I recognize he is the God of gods. He's, he's over every one of them. And so if you say anything bad against this God, you're going to be torn limb to limb, your house laid in ruins, and, and you're going you're gonna to be, be dead. That's basically what he's saying. As we said last week, that's not very Christian of him, and that's not the way Christianity is to be spread, and that's not the way we're to see it. But, but let's go on. One thing is for sure, I think, between verse 3 and verse 4, there is a 
there's a fairly lengthy amount of time, okay? I, I don't know how long, but he, he kind of has a little different change in, in, a, in attitude here, it would seem like. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. Please notice all the my's and I's and all of that. And I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay on my bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. He just said, God's in control. God reigns. God, this God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this God of Daniel is the God who secures and takes care. And now he says, this, th this alarmed me. Verse 6, so I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me and that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians and the enchanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers came in and I told them the dream. He's a little more lenient this time. He doesn't say, tell me what the dream is and then interpret it, he, he, as he did in chapter 2. But he says, here's what I dreamed. What, what does this mean? Make known to me its interpretation. At last, at last, excuse me, I'm skipping ahead. Verse 7. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in. I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. Now, I don't know if they wanted to take a shot at it or not, but I think they were smart enough to say, listen, last time we did this, we almost lost our heads. And, and Daniel came in and knew it all and interpreted it all and told the dream and interpreted the dream and, and, and he was exalted and lifted up. And if we give an interpretation and Daniel comes into this place and all of a sudden Daniel says, no, 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 that's not what it means at all. This is what it means. We're in real trouble. So they just said, we abstain. Kind of took the coward's way out, I think. Kind of like a lot of us do a lot of the time, don't you think? told them a dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belshazzar, after the name of my God, a little, little shift there, God is over all, God, but this is my God. This is my God, and I named Belshazzar, Daniel, after him. And, in, and so Belshazzar came before me, he was named Belshazzar, after the name my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Plural, little g. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar recognizes there's something unique, something special about Daniel's life. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, king of the magicians, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. And the visions in my head as I lay in my bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great and the tree grew and became strong and its top reached to the heaven. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant. And in it was food for all. The beast of the field found shade under it. And the birds of the heavens lived in its branches. And all flesh was fed from it. And I saw the visions, I saw the vision, I saw in the visions in my head as I lay in bed. And behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven, and he proclaimed aloud and said this, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip it of its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be as with the beast of, of the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's to the, uh, to, and let a beast mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers. The decision of the world, uh, the word of the holy ones 
to the end of the uh, end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men you, you see Nebuchadnezzar is still just kind of has this vision of of the heavenly places being sort of a, a, a royal or a heavenly or celestial parliament where all the gods are seated around and they're kind of all putting in their best ideas and, and their ideas and, and they're all you know they're all ruled but there is this one holy God this this one holy one the most high who rules the kingdom of men and gives to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men hear that there's a God who rules over all and, and he, he rules over the kingdoms and and he sets up as the ruler over the kingdom the lowliest ones doesn't have to be the greatest ones that's important it's important what we see on the screen right there it's important to understand that and realize that and remember that verse 18 this dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods, plural, is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar in Babylon, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. I mean, how much worse could it be than what you told me in chapter 2? The statue that's built, this inanimate object with a golden head that is me, and, 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 and it's going to come crashing down by this rock that is not hewn out by human hands, but by a divine hand, by God himself. How much worse could it be than that, Belshazzar? It's kind of the implied or stated thing there that, Nebuchadnezzar saying, he said, don't let it alarm you. Belshazzar, who is Daniel, answered and said, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which you which was food for all under which beast of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived it is you O king who have grown and become strong your greatness is grown and and reaches to the heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump and its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, and the tender grass of the field, and, and let him be wet with the dew of the heaven, and, and, his, and let his portion be with the beast of the field, till seven periods of time shall pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord and King, the King, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, like a cow, if you will, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know, till you know, Get that. Till now he's been saying it, but do you really know it, King Nebuchadnezzar? Until you know that the Most High rules the, he the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness. There is a call to repentance here. There is a call to coming to the point, once again, of understanding that it is in the cross and not in us 
that there is hope. O oh, king, repent. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and, let your iniqui- and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. So Daniel gives us the understanding here through the dream of what God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar in that dream that while you're saying all the right things, Nebuchadnezzar, your heart is not right. While you're saying all the right things about God, while you're saying all the right things about Jesus Christ, your heart is still set on yourself. You're still filled with pride. You're still filled with this idea of I rule, I reign, I'm in charge, I can do it all. Nebuchadnezzar, that may, seem, that, that may seem innocent in your sight. But in the sight of a holy and an almighty God, that is sin. It's iniquity. And, and you've mistreated the, the Israelite exiles. You've, you've treated them poorly. And, and you've not shown them mercy or justice or kindness. And, and you need to repent of all this and practice righteousness and show mercy to the oppressed. And maybe, just maybe, out of your repentance, God will lengthen the years of your prosperity. It's not a prosperity gospel there, by the way. It's just a, a call to fall and repent of your pride. I'm going to illustrate that in a minute. If I don't get this read, I won't even get to the sermon. Verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the time of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace of Babylon. And, And the king answered, doesn't say who he answered, he just answered. I guess he answered himself. I mean, I'm the greatest around anyway. Who else is there smart enough to talk to besides me, right? Who is there greater than me to talk to? So he said to him, maybe he answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? I mean, you read that and you just expect a lightning bolt immediately, don't you? Is this not what I have done and what I have achieved and what I have built? I've used my wisdom, I've used my mighty power, I've used everything. And this is to the glory of my majesty. Just a few short time, 12 months earlier, he was saying, Blessed be the most high God. But I built it glory of my majesty while the words were still in the king's mouth I like that sounds almost like he's saying as he choked on his words while the words were still in the king's mouth there fell a voice from heaven O king Nebuchadnezzar to you it is spoken the kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field and you shall be made to eat eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know not just say but until you know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and immediately Nebuchadnezzar who was driven from among men ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. I I, I, I searched the internet for some kind of good picture of that. uh, And I found one, but I couldn't get one that would copy out of where it was. Uh, of uh, an artist who in in the 1700s drew Nebuchadnezzar on all fours with his hair flowing down, him eating grass and just kind of crawling around like a beast. Now some say, never heard of that. Listen, there is actually a psychiatric condition that that has been named in in our own day called uh, boanthropy. Boanthropy is a person who thinks he's a bovine, a cow, or a or a uh, 
ox in this case. And I don't say that to say, well, the, see, the, the, the word isn't dumb. It really is what it is. I just say that to show you that say it, it is a condition brought upon him by the Most High God. Pretty, pretty radical. You know, God, why couldn't you have just said, Nebuchadnezzar, repent? Why couldn't the voice of heaven just said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're prideful, you're filled with pride, you're arrogant, you're disgusting, just repent or else. He didn't do that. He just went to all the way immediately to the or else. I don't ever want to be at the or else. I really don't ever want to be at the point where God has to bring me low. You know, the, the scripture is clear. It, it never tells us to pray for God to make us humble. Have you ever noticed that? I know in a lot of our prayers, we say stuff like that. We say, oh, Lord, make us humble. Please don't pray that. The Scripture says, humble yourselves. And, and the passage here in, in, in Daniel is a, is a clear example of a lot of good New Testament teaching. I mean, you go to James, which is part of what Pastor Ricky read today, uh, James 4, 6 through 8. James says, but he, that is God, gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Or 1 Peter 5.5, 5, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Or Hebrews 12, 5, and 6, which is a, a word out that where the writer of Hebrews quotes Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, where he says, and, and have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are approved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Now, I don't know if there's indication there that, that Nebuchadnezzar is about to have a conversion experience. Daniel never tells us if that's the case or not. We're kind of left to our own understanding of it, but it does come to a pretty good ending if you look in verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of the days, these seven periods of time, whether it was seven years or seven months or seven weeks, he doesn't say. It's just seven periods of time. Could have been seven seasons that it went through, fall, winter, summer, spring. That's not in order, but you get the idea. Seven seasons in order that it went through. I don't know. It doesn't say. But at the end of these days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and when I looked up to heaven, my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. That, the wording there that Daniel uses in, in verse 34 uh, to begin that, it kind of carries, kind of brings to mind to me the, the wording of the prodigal son. You remember, remember that wording when Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son, and the son went out and squandered everything, and while he was working with pigs, not something a Jewish boy wanted to be doing, and just eating of the pig's pods and not, not getting it. He, he said, I, when he came to his senses, he said, I'll go back to my father's house where the servants eat better than this, and I will say to my father, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me a servant. Just make me a servant. Nebuchadnezzar says, I lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason, I came to my senses, returned to me and I blessed the most high God and praised him and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is, ever, is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation and all inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and as far as power and wisdom and everything goes, and, and, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Your will be done in heaven, oh, excuse me, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is saying there. It is done on, in heaven and it is done on earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? There's 
no challenge to the Most High. He does as he wills, and he wills what he does. Verse 36, at the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty, and my splendor returned to me. Hear that? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty, and splendor returned to me. I was back in the, I was all of a sudden reinstated to my, to my reign, to my throne. Now, who was reigning during this time of him out in the fields, calling the grass, eating grass, and acting like an ox, like a wild beast? I don't know. Maybe it was Daniel who was leading the nation. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Notice there he didn't say, and I developed or I made more greatness. It was added to me. It was given to me. It was a gift to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the kingdom of heaven for all his works are right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. If you look through the Old Testament, and if you read carefully the New Testament, the one thing that is at the root of all sin is pride. Pure and simple. That's what begins it all. I, I don't care whether it's I don't care what the sin is or the the, the magnitude of the sin. The, the one sin that is at the root of all sin is pride. And God wants to destroy that in your life and in my life. I'm a pastor. I'm not exempt from that, folks. One of the things I confessed and again repented of this morning as I heard those youth singing that song during the offertory, you know, I want him to be great. I want him to be exalted. I want to be able to say, you are the most high, you are the king who reigns forever, and I simply submit every desire I have, everything I have, everything I think I can do, I want to acknowledge I do it because you give it to me, not because I'm, a, I'm good and I'm, I'm capable or, or anything else. It's simply because of you. I knew a pastor once who God gave great things to. I knew him personally. And he went to a church, and, and he saw this church as a gift of God, and, and he trusted God, and he saw God begin to do a work, and all of a sudden this church went from about 325 to about 1,200 over a period of several years uh, at a point where they, they were in two worship services. They had to go to three, and, and then they said, well, we got to build, and we, they built a new campus that was four times as big as what we built here, and and it was beautiful, it was, it was exciting, and people were coming, and, and all things were happening. And, and, and all along, uh, this pastor was saying, it's, it's God, it's all of God. I mean, even, they even put a sign out front because they paid for that campus debt-free, not a penny owed. And they put a sign outside, financing provided by God. How much more glory can you give to God? But then this pastor while continuing to preach the, the truth, as far as I could tell, he began to think, you know, this, this, is, this is pretty cool. He never pastored a church that size. He never had that many people coming on Sunday morning to hear him preach, and, you know, and, and, and he was invited to, by people to come and tell other groups, what are you doing that, that you know, you've grown such, you built this campus debt-free, and come and tell us, how did you do that? What are your tricks? What are your... And, and, you know, I, this, this pastor would go, and, and he would always be clear to give God glory, but he also thought it's pretty cool. This pastor was always just kind of a small, you know, never had anything great or mighty. But. And, and then I think God said, you know, you just got a little bit too big for your britches to this pastor. And, and nothing bad happened. He didn't fall into any great sin, but he... All of a sudden, some of the attendance started dropping, and some of the some of the 
giving started falling off. And, and you know, some of the things started happening that, that in this pastor's mind, as he related to me, he, he got to saying, hey, if I don't do something, something's going to, it's going to fall apart. It can't fall apart. This is my kingdom. He didn't say that part, but he might have thought it. I mean, this is what I have built. This is what I've been invited places to tell, how we built it, you know. And if it starts falling apart, so he started neglecting prayer, neglecting the word, and not in the preaching. He preached the word, but, but his own personal life. And he started neglecting prayer, and he started saying, man, if I don't get something done here, it's not going to get done. I've got... And so he mistreated his staff, and he, he, was, he was short with them and, and, and tried to manipulate things around so it would grow again. It just kept going until finally this pastor literally came to a point of burnout. And he stood before his church, and he confessed the sin of pride. He said, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen any money. I haven't been unfaithful to my wife at least not in a way that the church would think was really bad. I may have had a mistress of the church. He may have had a mistress of the church. Oh, what the heck. That pastor I know, it's me. And, and it came to a point where God just said, look, Phil, you're not in control. And, and you're not the one who rules over this or any other kingdom. This is my kingdom, this is my church, and I will give it to whom I will. And I sort of went into a, thankfully I didn't crawl on the ground and eat grass and everything, but I went into three years not pastoring because I was, I was hurting, I was broken, but all because of pride. All because I thought, hey, we've built this. I've built this. God, I give you the glory, but I've done this. That incipient pride that always comes in. I mean, it happened to you and your business. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. According to Nebuchadnezzar himself and according to his dream and according to what uh, Daniel says, no, no, it has been given to you. would I tell you that story I realize confession is good for the soul but it's really bad for the reputation right don't you understand something we're coming to 10 years as Grace Baptist Church we were born out of a, a mighty movement of God I am convinced we were born for a reason to fill a gap that needed to be filled in this city I'm convinced We didn't do it. I didn't do it. Pastor Scott and Pastor Ricky and Pastor Todd didn't do it. The deacons didn't do it. God brought us here. God did it. And next week when we meet to worship, we want to focus not on what we've done, but on who he is. And what he has done. Because we could very easily fall into the pride trap of saying, you know, we're, we're, we've come together and we're doing this around the word and our worship is, is, is more biblical and our, our, our teaching is more biblical and we are, we are something that the city doesn't have and doesn't, that, that really needs. And, and here we are. Look at who we are. We are nobody. That's what is made clear in this fourth chapter. Verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. They're dependent. You're dependent. I'm dependent. And if we just build another church that is like every other church, with the exception of we think we do things better than others do, then God help us because we have succumbed to the sin of pride. we as a church don't 
bow down and say, Lord God, most high, you are the only God, the living and the true God, and we acknowledge everything we have comes from you and you alone. then pride has taken over. And it may lead you to many other sins, but that's the sin that's taken over. David had that sin on, the, on his rooftop. He was the king. He didn't have to go do battle. He could stay home, and, and he could sleep late, and he could go up on his roof, and he could look out over all of his kingdom, and, and while his armies are off, and, and, and he could lust, and he could desire what he wanted. He could take Bathsheba, and, and when all this happened and she became pregnant, he could kill Bathsheba's husband because he was the king, and, and he could do what he wanted to do because I'm in charge, David said, and he fell. I hope it's in a bummer of a sermon for you because it's very encouraging to me that God calls us to humble ourselves before him. God calls us and, and says, see me for who I am and see me in all my glory and do not try to steal any of that glory because I will not share that glory with anyone else. But the glory is ultimately found in what you see on the screen. The glory is found at the cross. Did Nebuchadnezzar become a believer? I don't know, but I tell you what, in two weeks when we get back to Daniel after the anniversary and we, we look at chapter 5, Nebuchadnezzar is not there. And Daniel doesn't take any doesn't even take a word to say, oh, Neb died, now Belshazzar's in. He doesn't say, oh, Neb got saved and God just took him on to heaven. He didn't, doesn't say that. He doesn't say Neb reverted back to his polytheism when it sounded like he had adopted the true and the living God as the only place for his faith. He doesn't say any of that. So I don't know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. I know what happened to that pastor that I know. It comes to a point of just repentance. And if you want to repent of true sin in your life, you have to begin with pride. Look what I have done. Even in our salvation, sometimes we talk like, boy, God sure was lucky to get me. I did this, I did that. No, at the cross, his love ran red. And when we trust in his work on the cross, his finished work, and his work on the cross alone, my sin is washed white. My pride is dealt with. Completely? No. No. Now, i, I got to confess to you, I, I'm in a real confessing mood today. When I stood down here before the service, I felt that same pride that I felt 20 years ago. Not quite, but close, 15 years ago. I felt that same pride welling up when I looked around. I said, gosh, there's nobody here. What are we going to do? Attendance is down. Where is everybody? Why are they not here? We're going to have great worship today. The, the youth are going to lead us in great worship. And, and, and we're going to look at Daniel. And we're going to, where is everybody? I must be doing something wrong. Maybe I am. But if I am, it's I'm dependent on me and my preaching and the music and whatever to have people here who need to be here. It's all Do I want to see this place full? Absolutely. But if I want to see it full so that people say, hey, you know what, Bill Haynes is filling the place up, then, then pride has taken over. God help me, I don't want that to happen. Proverbs says, pride brings destruction. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, may not even be next week. Pride brings destruction. Oh God, 
break us, break me. Thinking more highly of myself than I ought. Of seeing anything as coming from me and my intelligence or my cleverness and not from God Almighty. Pray with me. Just pray right now. Ask the Lord to show you pride. Maybe it's because of your job or your education or your abilities or people that like you or maybe even people that don't like you, that you're proud they don't. Pray that God will show you grace because this morning you are humbling yourself in his presence. Pray that he will give you the grace to be even more humble. Not to don't pray to ask him to make you humble. That's, that's tough. But grace humbles. Grace is so good. Father, do your work as only you can. Show us our pride. Search us and know us. And show us our pride. Pride keeps us from ministering to other people. Pride keeps us from reaching out to other people. Pride makes us think we're better than other people. And, and, and we build walls. Lord, help us, help us repent of pride and tear down walls. Not for our glory, but for your glory. We pray in Jesus' holy name.